Minister for Culture, Community and Youth, Mr. Edwin Tong. Chairman of the Council of Presiden Presidential Advisors, Mr. Eddie Teo. My parliamentary colleagues, distinguished guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to join you here today for your last day of the conference and to see such a large crowd here. And to all our overseas guests, a warm welcome. And I hope you've had a very fruitful event so far, interacting with one another and learning new insights about how we can build more cohesive societies. You know, this event could not have come at a better timing because about a week ago, we open up further our COVID measures. We say that masks are optional now indoors. Optional means you can still wear if you want to, but it's interesting that in this room, I think almost everyone has decided not to. It's okay if you choose to wear. Please do not feel uneasy, that's fine. If you wish to wear a mask, it's okay too. But it's no mean feat to gather so many of us from all over the world here in one room, and I'm sure we will all treasure, treasure such phys physical gatherings more than ever, especially after what we have been through these last two and a half years. We've all had our own experience navigating the last two and a half years of COVID-19. It has been a difficult journey, full of ups and downs. We've had our share of setbacks everywhere around the world, but I believe it has also taught us some valuable lessons. Beyond a public health crisis, the pandemic was also a test of social cohesion. It demanded the best of everyone in society from government to healthcare workers, from essential workers to ordinary citizens, everyone had to come together and do their part. And key to that collective action was trust. Trust in the medical authorities and in one's government to manage the crisis. Trust in one another to do the right thing. Under the pressing strain of a pandemic, the true texture of society shone through. Whether people would mask up and get themselves vaccinated, whether they would exercise personal and social responsibility, and whether they would rally together to support one another. All these revealed the strength of trust and social cohesion. And indeed, it turned out to be a key factor why some countries fared better than others in dealing with the pandemic. An Oxford study, for example, found that high-trust countries had lower COVID death rates. They, they looked at all the different factors. Is it your healthcare system? Is it your medical advice? Is it all of these things? But in the end, none of these things were the defining factors that resulted in lower death rates. The key factor was the level of trust in a society. So having a strong foundation of trust matters, and it matters greatly. When a crisis hits, if trust is high, half the battle is won. Of course, across many countries, we are fortunately now in a better situation than before where COVID is concerned. But the challenges never end. Supply chain disruptions have led to the rising cost of food, fuel, and electricity, straining social cohesion in many places. Geopolitical tensions have made the world even more dangerous, troubled, and volatile. And in such a backdrop, peace and stability in Asia can no longer be taken for granted. Each of our societies will be tested, perhaps severely, in the coming years. And therefore, the question for all of us is this. How can we deepen the reservoir of trust in our societies to strengthen social cohesion in our societies as we enter a more volatile world? Naturally, every society has its own circumstances, its unique cultural and historical context. And while we can learn from one another's experience, it's up to each society to negotiate and balance the competing interest amongst its people. So let me today share very briefly a few of my own reflections from Singapore's vantage point, and I hope this may resonate with you in your various fields of work. 
if I were to distill Singapore's approach, it would be this, that social cohesion does not come about by chance, but it's achieved only through a deliberate and consistent effort to understand one another, to accommodate one another, and to flourish together. So let me touch on these three points briefly. First, social cohesion begins with all of us working together sincerely to understand one another. Because we naturally gravitate towards those who look or sound like us and away from those who appear different. That's just human tendencies. And if we let these instincts take charge and get in the way of mutual understanding, social cohesion will be doomed. And so we must actively seek to overcome these basic human tendencies. And this starts with something very fundamental, which is the idea of fostering contact and interaction between people of different backgrounds. And in Singapore, again, we do not leave this just to chance. We do this very deliberately. For example, our housing policy, our public housing policy ensures that people of different races live in the same block, in the same neighborhood, so that they have opportunities to interact with each other in their daily lives. The children will play together in the same playgrounds and they grow up together, fostering that sense of common identity. Our national schools, as well as national service in Singapore or compulsory military service for the males, are the common formative experiences for all young Singaporeans, regardless of their backgrounds. So whether it's playing together, eating at the same hawker centres, or going to the same schools, these shared experiences help our people see that they have more in common than they might have first imagined. At the same time, we put much effort into promoting dialogue amongst community, religious, and government leaders. And one way we do this is through the multiracial and multi-religious harmony circles. This brings together local leaders and their communities. They visit one another's places of worship. They learn about communi other communities' histories and cultures, and even participate in each other's religious and ethnic celebrations. So through such platforms, Singaporeans of different faiths, different races, interact with one another, understand one another's perspectives, and hopefully establish friendship and trust with each other. But engendering social contact alone is not enough, because in diverse societies, and many of ours are diverse societies, there are bound to be issues where we do not see eye to eye. There may even be deeply held positions stemming from fundamentally different world views. And often these are strong convictions that we cannot easily set aside. The question then is how do we resolve these fundamental disagreements? How do we strike a balance and not allow different views to tear a society apart? And across the world, we've seen many instances of such disagreements leading to division. In the absence of dialogue and compromise, the issues turn into zero-sum battles. If I win, you lose. There's no other way. So groups start pitting themselves against one another. The texture of society changes to one of suspicion and antagonism. And under such strain, it becomes difficult to even tackle existential issues where we all have stakes in, like climate change. Singapore's own history in resolving such differences was instructive because we had experienced violent racial riots in the 60s. And after that lesson, we resolved to go down a different path. And so this leads me to my second point, which is that we have decided to resolve differences through negotiation, and compromise by fostering a culture of accommodation. How have we done this? Our guiding principle is to preserve maximum space for each community to lead their lives. You don't have to assimilate to any common standard. Every community is free and given space to lead their lives. And it doesn't mean giving each group everything they want, 
but rather we strive to arrive at a balance of interest that everyone can accept and live with. It also means rejecting calls for maximum entitlements by every single group and avoiding attempts to construe every compromise as an injustice. And that's not easy to do, but over time it has become ingrained in our collective mindset. And when people see this, see that this is not only possible, but valuable and precious, it spurs them on to engaging one another, building consensus, finding ways to compromise different views and deepening social cohesion in the process. This is, of course, a never-ending journey. It's always a work, work in progress because society's norms and views will continue to evolve and so too must our policies. And so too will, the, will be the balance we strike in our society. And so we continually review and update our policies, not through forceful, top-down decisions, but through negotiation and compromise. Finally, to foster social cohesion and trust, societies must allow everyone to flourish together. At the end of the day, individuals in a society must feel that they are part of the society, where they can benefit from the nation's progress, where they can forge dignified and fulfilling lives for themselves and their families, where they can see their children doing better than they did. In short, they must see an arc of progress in their society and not feel eclipsed by it. And that's why it's important that we pursue inclusive growth, where a rising tide does lift all boats, where prosperity is shared widely by all segments of society. Again, it's easier said than done, as we all know, because across many places around the world, we have seen inequality stretch out the gap between the haves and the have-nots. In the developed world, stagnant wages have led the middle class in many places to lose hope for a better life. And when people find themselves excluded from the nation's progress, they grow resentful. They feel that the system is not fair, the system is stacked against them, and all these unhappiness and frustrations become fertile ground for exclusionary and xenophobic politics, which only exacerbates social divides. Uh, no society is immune from these forces, certainly not Singapore. And that's why we continually review our policies to see how we can pursue inclusive growth and continue to Minim or narrow our income gaps. And that's why we have embarked recently on an exercise to refresh and strengthen our social compact, to ensure that we can pursue robust and inclusive growth with opportunities for every citizen, and to provide assurance to our people that they will be supported if they fall on hard times, that they will not be left to fend for themselves in a dangerous and volatile world. We've called this exercise Forward Singapore because we hope to build consensus on the way forward and in doing so, deepen our social co cohesion. And crucially, we want everyone in Singapore to have a part to play in shaping this new social compact because building a better, more inclusive Singapore is not just the government's responsibility but also that of every community and every citizen. So for the Singaporeans here, I hope you will actively contribute your ideas and efforts to this exercise, really as an extension of the conversations you have been having these past three days. And as we urge society to come together, to hear from one another and examine what each of us can contribute and what trade-offs we would be prepared to accept, I'm confident that we can strengthen our social compact arrive at the future we all want as Singaporeans. To our international friends, we are sharing what we have done in Singapore. We hope it will be useful for you and will provide food for thought as you go back to your respective countries and think about how you might chart your own way forward to build more cohesive societies. Uh, to conclude, each of us is involved in the project of so social cohesion in different ways, in our respective communities and societies. It's not easy, 
and it often can seem like an uphill battle. Sometimes it seems like you take three steps forward and then you take another two steps back and then you keep on struggling to move forward. But I hope as a community of practitioners, of leaders, we will encourage one another and we will press on in our shared labours because the work is never finished and it must carry on. For if we do, if we not only deepen, tighten and strengthen the societies we belong to, we will also do our part to make this world better and perhaps a little brighter. And that is certainly a project well worth our while to pursue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DPM Lawrence Wong, for that uh, great speech to launch our little dialogue we have on stage here with you. Uh, looking around the room, you can see many different faces, international Singaporeans. But one of the things that uh, struck me is a large number of young people. Yeah. So uh, I'm quite afraid of engaging young people because I am not... Uh, my wife called me a dinosaur with regard to technology. Yeah. Sometimes I don't even know how to switch off the handphone. Uh, but uh, young people's way of communication, DPM, is really with the smartphone, with the computer, with the internet. And uh, often we hear this difficulty of connecting among the younger guys and the older people because of this technological phenomenon. So going forward, how else can we uh, bring some of the ideas of the many young people in this room, their little organisation, their big organisation, to the larger community out there? Sure. Well, I'm good. first of all, Ken Yong, I'm not, I'm not that young. <laughs> but younger than me, lah. Um, I suppose I fall in between. Right? You have people who are you know, older, who have seen Singapore's formative years, like my parents. You, you know, and, and those in Singapore, we call them our pioneer generation, our Madeka generation, because they saw through Singapore's independence. Uh, that's, I came shortly after that, but uh, I'm also not representative of the younger generation who came after me. So I sort of fall in between. And so I hopefully can help play a role to bridge between two different generations. But you are absolutely right that uh, people interact differently. There is that sense of generational differences. Uh, young people connect, uh, interact and engage a lot through social media. So we must be present where they are. We must learn platforms and tools that will engage them and involve them. And I'm glad that there are many young people here and I want to encourage all of you to continue to play an active role in shaping your respective communities and finding ways to bridge generational divides, engage the older folks, but also uh, engage within your own communities. And for the older folks, you have to make the effort to reach out and involve young people. I mean, it goes more than saying, let's have a youth wing in my organization, frankly. It's very easy to have youth wings, but if the youth wings are run separate from the main organization, if they are left, if there is no interaction, if they don't feel a sense of empowerment, uh, then they will not feel connected to the broader community. So you really need to spend the, take the effort for the ones who are leaders in your present organizations to engage your youths, to empower them, to find out what interests, what causes they are interested in, they are passionate about, and give them space to initiate these projects, but importantly, to maintain that relationship with them. That's so important, to understand where they are and to be engaging them at their level. Right. Don't expect them to come to your level. You have to engage them at their level. And for the young people, I would say, be respectful of your seniors. Don't feel always that they are nagging at you because they are <laughs> simply sharing experiences that they have gone through. And we should take these words of wisdom seriously. 
right? That they have been through a lot more than, than you have. So, and so, you know, you may not have heard it firsthand because you say, wow, this is so far removed and surely we can move on from now, you know, from all the history lessons. But, um, you know, I think it's it worth your while to pause, appreciate that you have seniors who have gone through a lot more than you have, sometimes very painful lessons in history and always bear that in mind as you think about charting your own way forward so that you do not have to repeat the same mistakes and you can learn from the ex these experiences and build on what we have been through as a society and find new ways forward. And also if we can continue to bridge these gaps, I hope we can uh, move forward together, young and old. Thank you, DBM. So when you do your Forward Singapore, uh, on the official agency side, they must also bear in mind the older guy like me. Of course. Uh, we, of course. For those of you from outside Singapore, we call Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong member of the 4G political leadership. Yeah. So he mentioned about Pioneer, first generation, Mateka, basically second generation, and people like us, third myself, generation. third generation, but we hardly hear 3G. La. Now it's all 4G. And the 1G, yeah, because the 4G had to tap from the 1G, and the 1G expect 4G to do certain things. There are very few 1G left, yeah. But anyway, that's the way. That's the way we synchronize ourselves here. Yeah. But I think the critical element then, uh, DBM, is the way in which we use our technology. Uh, so this is something that I think the faith groups, the organization dealing with various religion will have to uh, see some more additional ideas and maybe more sure. provision of resources. Sure. Uh. Well, <laughs> we are happy to provide resources. I think resources we can deal with, but learning how to use technology better, uh, that's an ongoing process. The irony, I think, in this age and the mystery of the world that we live in today is that technology is enabling us to connect so much with people, so much ability to interact, connect with one another, never before. And yet, interestingly, you find a greater sense of emotional stress, loneliness, alienation in, in societies everywhere, even amongst young people who are using social media. And so why is that the case? I, I, no one has the answer, but I suppose in my mind, Part of this is because, you see, if you look at the arc of history, perhaps in the 60s, in the 70s, everyone focused on community. It was very strong. And in the last few decades, we have had a lot of focus on the individual. You are free to be every, anything you want. And that's great. It's great for individual empowerment. But I think it has detracted from that sense of human connections and that sense of community. And when people feel isolated and alienated, they do what our evolutionary roots tell us to do, which is we revert to tribe. And that's okay, but if your tribal identity, whatever it is, it could be your race, your religion, or whatever it is, if that identity becomes so entrenched in your ideology, then it is very hard to compromise, as I mentioned just now, because compromise is dishonor. Compromise is a bad word. And we, should, we are trying very hard to avoid that. We are trying very hard to uh, have a situation where when groups come together to discuss issues, it becomes a war of all against all where there's no possibility of compromise altogether. And that's why when I talked just now about fostering contact, fostering understanding, but importantly, fostering that culture of accommodation. Well, that, that really, I think, goes beyond technology. We should harness technology, but we should learn to build these more fundamental mindsets. Thank you, DBM. In the last few days, we hear a lot about technology also. And the 
challenge is always how to harness it for whatever we are hoping to do. So and, and technology sometimes, if not r used well, can amplify these tribal identities. Yeah. It can amplify the worst of human tendencies. So I think technology can be a powerful force for good, but we need to find ways to use it um, productively. And I think it's not just about the technology. I think a lot of it really relies, requires hybrid forms of interaction. We cannot do away with the face-to-face. -face. We need that physical contact, but we can certainly leverage on technology and make better use of technology to improve our human connections. Yeah. So the challenge is really to make it more accessible. Absolutely. EPM, there are quite a few questions uh, from our uh, audience and those online, but they revolve around mostly about Singapore. So this is an international conference on cohesive society. Uh, I thought I should just uh, let you know that there are a lot of questions about Singapore and its systems and whatever. Uh, but since we are really an international gathering, we should uh, be a bit more uh, international. Sure. So maybe Have just one way to respond to some of these points uh, raised by the uh, uh, audience. Uh, how do you see this balance between traditional values and cosmopolitan and now uh, with technology, the younger generation, they have certain ideas. You mentioned about you know, reaching out, not just to have a youth wing, but uh, having meaningful and purposeful activities between the young and the older generation. So maybe uh, what kind of uh, values that you see as we go forward uh, Singapore, how we can share with our ASEAN partners, how we can do more, absorbing some of the good ideas from the region and uh, sharing with our people and which hopefully Singaporeans can reach out uh, to uh, connect with the people more uh, in the region. Sure. It, in Singapore, we strive to be both an open, cosmopolitan, global city as well as an endearing home for our people. And it's not easy to achieve both together. It's more than an issue of values, but it's also an issue of identity and the place that Singaporeans have in a city. This is just one city state, which is open, cosmopolitan, and connected to the world. It's not easy for a country to achieve this, let alone a city like us. So we are constantly finding ways to make sure that we strengthen that compact where Singaporeans support such a balance. And doing this requires multiple approaches. It starts with, I think, some of the issues I talked about in my speech earlier, uh, ensuring that everyone in Singapore can flourish. Everyone has the opportunities to maximize their potential and excel in whatever chosen profession or field. Because if people don't even feel that there are opportunities for them to do so, if they feel that Singapore is becoming a place where only a certain segment of society benefits, where wealth gaps continue widen, then I think we are finished. The, the, the citizen will not support the compact that we have. What's in it for me, they will say. Why would I want to have such an open, globalized city when I'm not seeing any benefits. This is true in Singapore. I'm sure it's true for all the countries that our guests come from. So our key first priority has always been to foster inclusive growth, to make sure that we take care of Singaporeans, not in a way that's protectionist, not in a way that closes up our borders, but in a way that gives Singaporeans every chance to compete with people outside of Singapore. That means investing in human capital, investing in opportunities, giving every child a good start in life regardless of their backgrounds, and investing in education beyond just formal schooling years, but in continuing adult education and training, providing more protection and assurances for people in the workplace, for example. These are all things we are continuing to review and improve. And then 
I, the second aspect of this is really about how within Singapore we can continue to have that conversation as we talked about to strengthen our common ground and to strengthen that sense of solidarity we have as Singaporeans. Because there will be Singaporeans, as I said, our approach is not one where we force everyone to assimilate to a particular definition of what it means to be a Singaporean. We allow different groups to have space, to live their own lives, to celebrate their cultures, their heritage, their identities. But across these different communities, there's something overlapping. And that overlapping part is our Singaporean identity. It's what distinguishes us as Singaporeans. This is why a Singaporean may be one who has worked overseas for a long time, cosmopolitan in outlook, so to speak, or a Singaporean may be one who has only worked in Singapore doing what might appear to some to be blue-collar work, but still, you, you may say, very different life journeys, life trajectories, but still there's something we have in common. It's partly the way we speak, the way we talk, it's partly the food we share, but it goes beyond that. I mean, food brings us together, but it's more than just food. It's also the values we have as Singaporeans. It's the outlook we have, our shared memories of what we have been through as a young nation, vulnerable, and yet being able to succeed together as one people. So these are important conversations, and, our, and, and continually we are trying to focus on that common ground across our diverse communities. What is it that makes us Singaporean, and how can we strengthen that sense of solidarity? I guess this is what you said about the common space. Uh. Very much so. Yeah, and uh, one or two of the uh, questions came into our computer here. Basically, Singapore is seen to be um, a small city state, very much governed by a rather effective government, yeah, top down most of the time. Yeah, so they. Only sometimes. <laughs> I set it up for him to deny it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir. Yeah, but most of the question wonder whether that model of uh, governance or that experiences that Singapore has uh, pursued, encountered, how will it apply more to the region? Because our region, you can see different countries having different systems and there is a very vibrant uh, uh, interaction across all segments of their political spectrum all, uh, 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 in their society. So they are always asking this question, how can the Singapore experiences be relevant to us in Southeast Asia? Sure. No, I, I don't pretend to have solutions for other countries. <laughs> I, I'm already having difficulties and challenges solving problems in Singapore. <laughs> so, I can only share our experiences and then I hope that our friends from overseas, you have to you know, adapt and you have to apply the underlying insights to your own context, recognizing that your context and circumstances are different from Singapore's. It is, but I should say this, that it is a bit of a fallacy and a bit of a um, misperception to think that in Singapore, everything is top-down. <laughs> because if it were, if it were, I don't think we would be able to get to where we are today at all. And, and I think it just um, doesn't recognize the many, many active contributions of people in our community. Um, it trivializes even the roles that so many people play in Singapore, our community groups, our self-help groups, individuals, volunteers, that spirit of fellowship, that spirit of self-help initiative coming together is so important to Singapore's success. And, and people see that we have very good, sound governance frameworks, and they only see that, but you have to see behind that, underpinning that, that level of individual effort, community effort. It's a very critical part of our success. It's the reason why Singapore works, not just because of top-down solutions. You can have top-down all you want, but if there is no followers, after, you know, if there's no bottom-up response, 
it wouldn't work anywhere in the world, even in Singapore. In our Singapore system, for the benefit of uh, our international uh, friends, uh, at the community level, we have many different grassroots bodies. And over the years, we have also uh, developed some very useful, what we call, harmony circles. Yeah, there is one way in which we try to communicate with each other. Uh, in your forward Singapore, how do you see this being uh, advanced? Uh, can we give them more to do? Uh, and uh, especially with regard to discussion on faith and sure. uh, religious tradition. Very much so, very much so. In, in, in Singapore's history, we've always conducted what we call national exercises to engage all the different groups. And we make a great effort to reach out to the different communities, whether it's volunteer groups, community groups, grassroots, community leaders, faith leaders, to get inputs, to get feedback, to see how we can move forward. This is not new in Singapore. That's why I mentioned just now, it's an important part of nation building, which people don't always see because they see only the visible aspects, which is government policies and solutions. You, they rarely go down to the ground to see all the many interactions that take place in our society. So we have always been doing that. And as part of this latest exercise, we will do more. We will do all that and more. In fact, we hope to engage more groups, reach out to um, different communities to get feedback and inputs. And we hope also to develop more innovative formats of engagement. Not just like this, where we sit down, you ask questions, I give input, which is fine, it's useful, but we hope to develop new, more innovative formats where uh, people will be empowered to do more. For example, developing citizens' panels where citizens can come together, they can dive into specific issues, wrestle with that particular issue, listen to different stakeholders, and then find the right balance and propose policy recommendations, specific policy solutions. So it takes more time from the citizens themselves. They just cannot just come to a session and say, I give you feedback. But you need to wrestle with the trade-offs and think about what the solutions are. And we are also looking at developing other platforms where beyond having citizens' panels to, develop, to come up with solutions, platforms for action. We call them Alliances for Action, where groups will come together. We will empower you with resources. We will provide you with the ability to not just talk, not just provide solutions, uh, provide recommendations, but in fact develop solutions and implement these solutions. So it goes beyond feedback. It goes beyond engagement. It actually involves doing something. And the groups can come together, they can partner fellow citizens, community groups, the government, and they will be empowered to develop these solutions. So these are some newer formats we hope to uh, develop as part of Forward Singapore. One of the set of questions here deal with uh, uh, what they call marginalised segment of our population. Even the most cohesive society in the world, cohesive country in the world, would have some of these uh, so-called marginalised groups so in your forward Singapore, uh, and talking to all of us here today, looking at the region and looking internationally, is there something that Singapore can contribute to share the views of some of these uh, groups that have not been included uh, by whatever policies or by traditions? And going forward, is there something that we in Singapore can uh, share with our ASEAN partners in particular, in your opinion? I, I can share what we are very focused on doing in Singapore because uh, there are certainly disadvantaged groups, even marginalised groups uh, in Singapore. Our, we are at the macro level, generally speaking, doing quite well. If you look at income inequalities in Singapore over the last decade, the income gaps have in fact been narrowing. They have not been widening. Incomes of lower income families have been rising faster than that of the median worker. All that is positive, but still, when you look at some of the lower income families, they have issues and they have concerns. 
I, I, I recognize that marginalization is not just a matter of economic growth and economic well-being, but I think that's an important aspect of it. And many of them at the lower end do continue to struggle. So we are continually looking at how we can help them and it's an issue that goes beyond providing more financial help because it's a very complex issue. Very often, when you reach out to these families and you understand the issues they face, it's multifaceted, it's complicated. There may be family issues, marital issues. Then you may have people who are ex-convicts, ex-offenders. You may have drug addiction all of which is not going to be solved simply by saying, look, I give you more money or some basic income. It's not. In fact, it may even be counterproductive. So, in fact, taking a more family-centric approach, understanding the needs of those families, what exactly are these needs, and providing wraparound solutions from the government side, bringing together different agencies so that they don't have to find, you know, go through, j jump through hoops and, you know, in order to get help. Because some of them may not even know which agency to approach. But providing a convenient, seamless, wraparound solution that addresses their needs. That's what we are trying to do, but it is highly, highly resource intensive. It takes a lot of coordination and just to help one family, you've got to bring a whole team of people together, counsellors, social workers, volunteers. Uh, but we think we can do it in Singapore because we are just one city. We are so compact. And if we marshal our resources, not just in the government, but amongst community groups, uh, I think we are able to make a difference. So that's Singapore's way of dealing with it. I recognize that you, you may not replicate what we do. It may not be possible to replicate what we do in countries elsewhere. But as I said, uh, we are happy to share our experiences and people will have to see how they can adapt uh, these insights and lessons to their own individual context. Thank you, DBM. There is a question here which is rather interesting. Um, trying to draw the difference between relations on interfaith and inter-ethnic relationship. So going forward, especially uh, us in Singapore and the rest of the region, ASEAN in particular, but I guess it's also applied across to all other countries, we see intensification of inter-faith issues, but at the same time, inter-racial, inter-ethnic uh, challenges. Do you have any thought that you'd like to share with our audience here? Well, it's, you know, interfaith, Based on our own Singapore experience, interfaith, yeah. inter, inter ethnic, these are always fault lines. And, and there will be new fault lines. Sometimes people say, well, you know, maybe we have progressed, we have arrived, and we can, we can take these issues less seriously. I think perhaps younger people may reflect that sort of thinking, and it's good. I think I, it's good that we have that sense of idealism that at some point in time, we will go beyond uh, these differences in thinking where it comes to religion, race, identities, and all that. And we can all see ourselves as one people. We must continue to have hope that this will be possible. But I think the dangers of communalism and racialism are always there. They can never be eradicated, unfortunately. Uh, if I give a metaphor or an analogy which is more current, think about the virus. We say that COVID-19 cannot be eradicated. We have to learn to live with it. It's endemic. Well, I think the dangers of these race, religion, and identity fault lines are similar. We will never eradicate them. They may be dormant, but under a certain conducive environment, they will come up again. It's like exactly like the virus, right? Now we seem, okay, we can live with COVID-19, it's okay. But if our immune systems are strong, uh, we are vaccinated, well, fine, it does little harm. But the minute our immune systems weaken, then 
the virus will reassert itself. So it just means that we must continually stay vigilant uh, to the dangers of these fault lines tearing our society apart, find ways to protect ourselves, inoculate ourselves, have high immunity, not just against diseases, but against other forms of diseases that may be equally dangerous, if not more. Yeah. Well, the question keeps coming back. Uh, what is Singapore's role in uh, inter-religious uh, cohesion and how uh, the new generation of leadership in Singapore see Singapore's traditional way of managing our multi-ethnic, multi-racial uh, society going forward. And now they have complicated the situation with things like technology yeah, and mobilization of resources for uh, the young people's idea, different groups. So since there are so many questions along this line, I decided to go back again to ask you, is there any particular um, initiative that you as yourself and later as leader of the government in Singapore and later as Singapore in ASEAN and part of the international community would recommend to uh, our younger groups, many of them have ideas now already floating around and in the next day or two they are going to crystallize this into some written form for our uh, conference organizer to think about. Maybe you'd like to share one or two ideas you have. How do we channel this kind of uh, enthusiasm and um, uh, willingness to commit uh, more attention, more effort into uh, activities bridging the young among themselves and bridging the young and the older generation? I'm very happy that there's such energy and ex enthusiasm amongst our young participants. So I would continue to encourage all of you your contributions do matter. I'm looking at this side because it seems like the young people are here. Maybe it's not. No? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, all right. Well, well, I suppose here also young, but young at heart, young at heart. Um, no, if, if for all the young leaders who have participated in this conference, thank you for your participation. And, and I hope you don't see this just as a three-day event. You come here, you're enthused, and then you go home, and that's it. You know, life goes back to normal. But continue to pursue that excitement, that passion that you feel about building more cohesive societies. And your contributions matter greatly in Singapore, if you're working in Singapore, but also in the countries that you represent. And every effort matters. Every individual can make a difference whatever projects you are going to start, right? It can be as simple as building a network within your community, bringing people of different backgrounds together, providing some help for those in need, and, and coming together as a, as, a, as a more cohesive community. So it can be as simple as that. But I think if you have that interest, you have that energy, please pursue it. If you are in Singapore and you want to do something well in, in the government, we will certainly support such initiatives, such ground-up efforts. We will even consider providing you with more resources to get it done because we want you to feel empowered that you can make a difference. Beyond Singapore, what can Singapore as a whole play, which was one of the questions you highlighted? I, I, I keep saying we, we cannot profess to have solutions for the region and the world, right? We are solving our own issues. We can share our experiences. We can convene conferences like these where, where people can come together, share, exchange best practices, learn from one another because certainly in Singapore, we should never claim to have all the answers. We must always have the humility and grace to know that we are always a work in progress. There are problems that are still never resolved, and we might very well learn from best practices elsewhere too. So we will try to be a convener, if you, can, if you will, where we can bring together communities like this, practitioners, leaders in your fields, share best practices, learn where we, uh, platforms where we can all learn together. 
uh, because that's the role that Singapore can be. We are, after all, a hub for the region. And we are well known as an economic hub, as a financial hub. But I think we can also be a hub for the region that promotes social cohesion, that promotes interfaith dialogues, inter-ethnic dialogues, and be that beacon of hope for countries everywhere. Thank you, DPM. From some of the questions online, I think many of these are younger Singaporeans, younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> they continue to have on this idea, you know, asking you to tell us more about how you're going to accommodate the differences among the groups in Singapore, how the government can uh, listen more to the people and allow certain things to be done, X, Y, Z. Yeah. And also this idea of bridging the digital gap. Yeah. So there are a lot of young people in this set of questions uh, trying to uh, at least get me to put some of these questions to uh, the Deputy Prime Minister. But I think he has sketched out the broad outline. Yeah. The thing is that my takeaway uh, as an organiser of this conference is that he's going to give us more resources uh, right now. <laughs> <laughs> We, no, but frankly, the resources, resources are very often, we, we can provide more resources. And in Singapore, I, I suppose there is always a temptation to say among Singaporeans, well, the government can provide resources and can solve the problems. And it's partly because we have been so effective at doing things over many decades. And so that, that's, that's, that's partly our karma, right? We, have, we accept that. And it's true in any successful organization. The more successful you are, the expectations are higher, and therefore you have to deal with higher, ever higher expectations. And as you get more and more successful, it gets more and more challenging to meet these ever raising expectations. We understand that. But we have to keep on reminding everyone that the whole task of building a better Singapore, if, if people think it's only the government's responsibility, then they are very mistaken. And if somehow there's a sense that you know, government can just happily spend more, but where do the resources come from? Resources have to come from citizens. You can't expect government to pay more or spend more and then say, look, I don't want to pay more in taxes. The two must go together. So how can we continue to design a system that's fair, that's progressive? Everyone pays their share of taxes or contributes to the common good, but obviously those with greater means will contribute more. And then when the government has these resources, we have to think hard about how we allocate them. And how we allocate these resources is never a top-down decision. It has to be representative of people's views, of Singaporeans' priorities. And then we can decide ac across competing demands what's the best way of allocating, how do we do it in a way that's fair, that will, that's equitable. And across the many years and decades, if there's one common theme in the government's approach, is that we consistently support the underdog. We always make sure that whether it's our tax system or our payments, our spending system, that there is more given to the lower income, the disadvantaged, the vulnerable, and we are always looking to uplift these groups in our society so that we can move forward together as one people. But people in Singapore are getting concerned that too much of such care is allocated to a certain segment of our population. And that could lead to more, what you call, dependency on the government. So, one or two questions here also ask, how do we streamline government policy in those directions? That may be a topic for another day, uh, DPM. Well, it's, it's always a balancing act. It's always a balancing act. I think it's true in the government. It's true amongst all of us. If you're a parent, you care for your children, but you worry that you over-provide them with love and such a wonderful environment. They do not grow up with their own ability to stand on their own two feet, to be independent, to be self-reliant. 
finding that balance is always challenging. So we, we are very mindful of that when we design any government schemes. Uh, we will provide as much assurance and care as possible, but we also want to ensure that government efforts are combined and com complement uh, that spirit of self-reliance amongst people. It's good to have you as a finance minister at the same time. <laughs> well, I think time is uh, about to uh, conclude this session. Uh, Maybe DBM, the last few minutes, you just want to share with us anything that our uh, audience uh, have not uh, uh, put it to you or in my questioning I have not addressed to you. Is there anything else you want to leave, any message uh, that you think this ICCS should uh, uh, think about more uh, substantively and practically going forward? No, well, I would... Just say that I, I hope it's been a fruitful time for all of you spending these last few days here in Singapore, learning from one another, listening to different views. For us, this idea of building cohesion is an existential matter. It's not even a good to have because Singapore is one of the most diverse societies in the world, if, if not the, more, the most diverse societies in the world. According Both. to the Pew Research, we are the most, the country with the most number of religion. That's different right. Area. So, diverse in terms of faith, religiously diverse, diverse in terms of race and ethnic ethnicity, very diverse. And all of this diversity in one little city, just over 700 square kilometers. And you can imagine if something were to go wrong, if we had racist, racial incidents, misunderstandings with regard to faith, how easy it is for all of this to just escalate into tensions. This is exactly what we had been through in the 60s. Uh, and, and that's why we take this so seriously. And the pioneers who had gone through that will say, never again, never again will we want to experience that in Singapore. I did not experience it myself, but like I said, I'm the in-between generation, right? So I experienced it um, by hearing from my parents who are in their 80s. My mom is in her 80s, my dad has passed on, but they went through that. Post-war, Singapore in the 50s, in the 60s, they saw how vulnerable it was. They went through race riots. My mom was living then in a she knew what it was like to be a minority because they, their family was a Chinese family living in a Malay kampong. They knew exactly what, you know, the, the sense of security, the concerns that they felt was very real. Vulnerability, yeah. And the vulnerability. And so we, we know how these things can change so quickly. They knew, they, they related their concerns, their anxieties of their times to me. And so I hear it from them. For the younger folks, you probably didn't hear it from your parents. Your parents may be King Yong's age or younger, maybe my age. So you, you hear it secondhand, thirdhand. So it's more distant. And when it's more distant, it is less vivid. It is less real. It's more in the past. And you think that maybe it's all these are the old you know, history books. We have overcome all that and... These things will never happen again. But really, we cannot leave that to chance. We don't want it to happen again, but we should therefore work very hard. Work, do, everyone do our part to make sure it never happens. And not just that it never happens, but we also find ways to strengthen harmony, strengthen cohesion, strengthen that sense of what makes us Singaporean together. Uh, we, we think that's of utmost importance as we navigate a more challenging world. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly shown us that in the last two and a half years, we have seen how trust in society is so vital to everything we do in our pandemic response. And we have been so blessed in Singapore, I think, to see that trust coming together. Trust between the government and the people of Singapore, trust amongst everyone in Singapore, not just Singaporeans, but even residents who are here, everyone working together. We've seen many examples of people 
cooperating with government measures, which we never take for granted because we've had many changes in our measures, a lot of frustration, but still people took it in their stride. There was tremendous forbearance and cooperation and we got through some of our most challenging times. We've also seen people across all walks of life doing their part, going out of their way to support vulnerable groups. Could be migrant workers in our dormitories, old folks who are living alone in their homes and people you know, going out to provide meals to them at homes. These are all ground-up initiatives. Tremendous sense of sacrifice and willingness to serve their fellow citizens and fellow Singaporeans or people in Singapore. So I think we should build on these strong foundations to keep on building solidarity and making sure that Singapore remains a high trust society. And I am very confident that we can achieve that. So I, for, for our Singaporean audiences, uh, it's a continuing work in progress, but I am confident we can do so. And I look forward to engaging with all of you in this journey of building a better, high-trust Singapore. For our friends from overseas, uh, I hope whatever we share today is useful to you, or this, this few days of conferences would be useful to you. And we continue to learn from you as well. All of you go through different issues, different challenges. But I think as a community of practitioners, we owe it to ourselves to support one another. Because at the end of the day, we are all in this together. And, and the world is so interconnected now. Any instability in one part of the world can easily impact other countries. We cannot say I'm insulated, I, I, I'm insulated from the problems anymore. And, and so it is in our collective interest to work together to advance this common cause that we all share and to build more cohesive societies everywhere we are. Thank you, DPM. I think the most important thing that we learned from our survey that we share with the audience has been this idea of trust and acceptance of diversity. And well, your comments really echo that uh, sentiment. Always remember the saying, right, that trust is built in drops and lost in buckets. <laughs> well, trust can be lost very, very quickly, but to build it, it's painstaking. So never take trust for granted. This was what my school principal once told me 50 years ago. Yeah. See, you see, I'm not, I'm not so young after all. Uh, I echo the words of your school principal. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, DBM. Thank you. I think uh, this is a very important point. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate your time with us Thank you. today. Thank you, Kenya.